Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 20, if you would. John chapter 20. Thank you, Jacob and Jana, for that wonderful, wonderful song. Great job. I'll tell you, um, did a wonderful job. Turn to John chapter 20, verses 19 down through verse uh, 21 or 23 this morning is where we'll be reading. Uh, I'm glad to see everybody here this morning. Earlier this week, I watched a documentary that said Jesus was coming back yesterday, and I, I waited all day. He didn't even write the sermon. I thought for sure he'd be back. No, I did not, all right, and uh, um, uh, yeah, but there was a prediction that Jesus was coming back yesterday. I, I'm going to say this to you as frankly as I can. If you see anybody that says Jesus is coming back on this particular date, you know that's not the date he's coming back. Just, just, just that you can be very careful. Back in, in, I think it was 1988, a guy named Harold Camping wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus Would Come Back in 88. All right, he was wrong 88 times. <laughs> All right, uh, they were wrong yesterday about that. Uh, people ask me every once, what are the signs of Jesus coming back? What's his signs? And we think, well, we had this earthquake over here, and we've got looming war with North Korea, and we got this. None of those are signs of the second coming. None of those are signs. Matthew chapter 24 says all of those are signs of the age we live in. Not of the second coming, but that's just part and parcel to the world we live in. The greatest sign of the second coming, if you want to try to figure out where we're at, is he says that the gospel must be preached in all the world. And there are still many, many, many hundreds of places in the world where the gospel has not yet been preached. So if you want to worry about second coming, get busy, which brings me to my message this morning. Over the last several weeks, we've been talking about reasons why we love the church. Um, and there are a lot of things that said bad about the church in America today. We hear a lot of negativity. People say, I don't go to church because uh, it's this, or I don't go to church because they did that, uh, or I you know, don't go to church because of whatever reason. Uh, there are a lot of negative written and talked about in the church today, but there are some very positive things. The church of Jesus Christ has been the greatest force for good in the history of the world. In the very first message, I talked about the fact that you know, we have hospitals, we have hospitals. We have uh, uh, all the different kinds of ministries to the poor. Those were all developed by the church. And so the church is the greatest force for good in the entire world. So we talked about four reasons why we love the church. We love the church, number one, because Jesus loves the church. And he gave himself for it. And so the very fact that Jesus loves the church tells me I should. He loves the church so much that he describes it as his bride. You know, how many of you ever would go to a wedding and say, boy, I really, I really like the groom, but I don't care much for his bride. I don't care much for his, well, you wouldn't do that, right? Um, the reality is, is that you, it, you know, if you love Jesus, you've got to love his church because he loves the church. Number two, we, we love the church because it serves God. Um, we found that the, there's a number of ways that, that we do that right here in our church. We, we, we serve God by making disciples, uh, that demonstrates our love of God. We teach people how to be followers of Jesus Christ. That's what a disciple is. We minister to the other members of the church when someone has a need. Uh, and, and our church happens to be, I, I think, pretty good at that. If you have a need, a, a, a difficult time uh, going on in your life, they reach out to you. They, they minister to you. They help you. Uh, we minister to our community in a number of different ways throughout the year. Last week, we talked about we love the church because it loves families. The plan of God that we looked at, and we're going to mention that a little bit again this morning, is built around families. God's initial plan was he made, creates Adam and Eve. He says it's not good for Adam to be alone, so he builds for him uh, uh, Eve and, and unites them together and forms the family. God loves the family. And it's his primary way of spreading the gospel. Uh, one of the primary jobs that we have as parents is to bring our children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, to teach them uh, about what God expects and about who he is. You're the first line of defense for your children to hear the gospel. They should hear it from you far before they hear it from me. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about one final reason why we should love the church. We love the church because it's on a mission. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis over the last several years on in the business world for developing 
well-crafted mission statements. I, I walked into a doctor's office here not long ago, and they had a mission statement up on the wall. And, uh, and uh, you know, almost anywhere you go anymore, you can find mission statements. Football teams have mission statements. Uh, uh, there's personal mission statements, you know. Uh, everybody seems to have a mission statement. I'm going to look just at a couple real quickly here. Just flip up on the screen. Uh, this is Nike. Some of you are wearing their tennis shoes today, all right? And um, this is their mission. This is what they say their mission, their purpose for existing is to bring inspiration and motivation to every athlete in the world. In other words, I, my, by the way, I'm going to say this very frankly. If you're an athlete and you need to be inspired by a tennis shoe, you ought to get out of the business, all right? <laughs> all right? I mean, have you ever, you know, you remember that day in the, in, in the Super Bowl when Tom Brady was down and he looked down and he saw the Nike swoop on his shoe and went, I can win this football game. All right, no, uh, but that's their mission, to bring inspiration and motivation to everyone. In other words, that's what drives them. When they get up in the morning, I don't know what you do at Nike. I have a friend of mine that actually works for Nike. I should have called him and asked him to do this. He got to throw out the uh, uh, first pitch at the Cardinal game here not too long ago. And uh, Matt works for them. And he's a vice president of something. Their job every day is to get up and say, how can we build products that will inspire and motivate athletes. There's another one. Flip this one up. This is Coca-Cola. This is a, and I got to say this, this is a big mission statement for a soft drink company, all right, to refresh the world in mind, body, and spirit. Now, I'll say this. Coke might quench your thirst. I really doubt, I mean, I've never been drinking, I've never gone over to the movie sat down with my Diet Coke, took a sip, and went, mm, my mind is at peace. Golly, I feel energized. My body feels so good. You understand, that's their mission. That's what they think. And by the way, that tells you that that they're broadening out. They're thinking bigger than just selling you a product. Coke actually wants to sell you an experience. I'll give you proof of that. If you ever watch some of their new commercials, watch how crafty they are about they, they, the, the first thing that happens is they drop ice into a cup, and then they start pouring the Coke, and the sight and the sound they want it to become an experience. They want it to become transcend just drinking a Coke to quench your thirst. All right? I Ikea. I don't know how much familiar you are with Ikea. They're the Swedish people that make furniture, weird furniture, and meatballs. All right? If you've ever gone to one of their stores, you can, it's the only furniture store in the world where you can go in and you can get meatballs, and uh, they actually sell even odd Swedish fish uh, uh, products there. I'm not sure what that's all about. But they also have a big mission, to create a better everyday life for the many people. You can tell they're Swedish. They can't speak English, all right? To create a better, um, I don't read that like the Swedish chef, to create a better everyday life, all right, for the many people. They want to make a, and what they're looking at is saying, we have this big mission. It's beyond just selling furniture. We want to give people an experience. Every business today, you go to almost any business, they have a mission statement. It is a, a purpose that gets them up in the morning and drives them. Over the last several years, this same idea has been brought over into the church. I have a friend of mine who pastors a, a very, very large church, one of the largest churches in uh, the Southern Baptist Convention over in Virginia. And, and a while back, I was talking to him, and he was telling me that he was taking his church through a process of crafting a new mission statement. Now, this is a very, very large church, thousands and thousands of members. And, and he said th they hired a consulting company to come in. They interviewed for like a, a, a six-month period their membership and, and questioned them and talked to them. They did focus study groups. They brought in uh, some of the leading um, um, uh, experts in church growth and church work. Uh, they even brought, the, I think Ed Stetzer was there. Some of the really big names in, in the church work in America today came in and talked to them. And, and they worked for over a year on crafting this mission statement. I asked him this question. I said, why did you do all that? Why did you spend, you spent thousands of dollars, hundreds of hours working on this 
meant, why did you do that? And here's what he said to me. He said, so that we could discover what our mission is. Can I say this to you? As much as I love my dear friend, and as much as I think he had every right, he had all good intentions of what he was doing, he missed the point. He missed the point. Here's the problem is, you don't have to discover your mission. It's already been given to you. We don't actually, in the church, now I want you to hear me very carefully what I'm saying, we don't actually have a mission. We don't have a mission. Jesus has a mission, and he's invited us to be on, or go on it with him. But it's not, our, it's not us to up, up to us to sit down and go, I wonder what I would like to do with my life. Now, let me see. In a lot of areas, that's a wonderful thing to do. Coca-Cola can sit down and say, we'd like to refresh the world, mind, body, and spirit. That's wonderful. They can do it. But as the church... We've been called to be on mission with Jesus. It is ultimately his mission, and we've just simply been invited to be a part of it. Let me show that to you in the Bible. In John chapter 20, Jesus is meeting with his disciples. It's on the Sunday night after he had risen, and look what happens. It says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, they're afraid. Jesus has just been crucified, and and probably in the disciples' mind, they're wondering really two things. Number one, what's going to happen to us now? Jesus is gone. If they kill Jesus, are they about to come and arrest and kill us? Remember, they are living in very, very difficult times. They just watched the, the, the Messiah, the one they'd been waiting for for all of these years, the one that they had been following for the fast, past three and a half years, be crucified and murdered. And they must have been wondering, my goodness, if they did that to him, what are they going to do to us when they find us? And so they're locked in this upper room waiting in fear. And they also must have been wondering this, what are we supposed to do now? I mean, for the last three years, our... Our purpose was pretty simple. We got up in the morning. We followed Jesus. Jesus told us what to do. We went and did it. Very simple. Now Jesus has died. And they're wondering, what in the world are we going to do? So notice what happens. It said in verse 3, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. He appears to them. That must have been startling in itself. The fact that they had watched him on Friday be crucified, and now here it is on Sunday evening, and there he is standing in front of them alive, and he says, peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side to prove basically who he was. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again. I like that he says again there. Jesus said to them again. In other words, this was not something that they were hearing for the very first time. Jesus had told them these same ideas and these same words before in other passages and other instances. And he says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of the world, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness of any, it is withheld. I want you to stop and look at a couple of things. Number one, Jesus reminds us here that he himself has been sent on mission, that the mission ultimately belongs to God. Jesus says, listen, I was sent by the Father. You know, over and over again, particularly in the Gospel of John, even though Jesus was fully divine, you know, uh, we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three equal in their essence and their nature, but distinct from one another in their personality. Jesus had all of the divine attributes, all of the divine nature of God. He was equal with God, and yet consistently when he came on, to, in, on earth, he reminds us that he came to serve God the Father. In other words, he says, I didn't come to do my own thing. I didn't just come down here to do my own mission, my own work. Jesus says, I've submitted myself to the Father. And we see that over and over and over again. In John chapter 6, verse 38, for instance, he says, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. 
He's reminding us there that Jesus is carrying out a mission that had been instigated by his father. And we could go back through, there's a lot of ways that we could approach this, but, but we could go back through the Bible and we could see that from the very beginning of time, God has been on a mission. In other words, he has a purpose. We, we joked around there at the beginning of the message about the second coming. But one of the important things about the second coming is that you need to know this. Just as God had a beginning for the universe, he has an end. He, he's in control of every point in between. We call the, the doctrine of end times. Donnie is teaching a class on, on, on Sunday nights uh, on the book of Daniel. And a uh, wonderful, wonderful class. If you haven't been in there, you ought to go and, and, and take that class. That's the study of what we call eschatology. That's a big word. But, but eschatology means the study, we usually say, of last things. But it's more than that. It's really a study of how God has been working throughout history to accomplish his purpose. One of the beautiful things that Daniel does is he takes and he shows that all of the different kingdoms of the world are actually coming into power and being taken out of power by the hand of God. That God is in control of everything. And so as God begins all the way back before time even began, he had a plan and every, the whole sweep of history. Did you know that? There's no surprises with God. God never wakes up one morning and goes, wow, so-and-so's having a bad day today. That surprises me. I thought they'd have a good day. He knows every moment of your life from the moment you begin to the moment you end. Now, I'm going to tell you why that's good. That means that ultimately he's in control. And we see that. We could unfold the Bible. You've heard me talk about this before. You could unfold the Bible almost like it's a, 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 a story. Um, you know, a story will have, you know, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Well, when the Bible, you sort of have four great scenes that lay out the Scripture. First of all, in Genesis 1 and 2, you see the creation of the world. God creates everything that there is. Several uh, weeks ago, we had the big eclipse, and people were asking me, what's the significance of the eclipse? Well, you know, we're having this eclipse. What, what does it mean? Well, it means that God has built a universe that is so ordered and so marvelous that we can predict down to the minute, down to the minute when the sun is going to pass, or the moon's going to pass between the earth and the sun at exactly the right distance, at exactly the right moment, so that it'll block it out. God has built the universe with this incredible order, incredible design in it. Every time you turn on the internet, you're experiencing God's creative abilities. It would be impossible to do that if the world was not predicted. Think about it. Every time you fly somewhere, you get on an airplane, Darren flies everywhere. Every time I see Darren, a picture of him on Facebook, he's getting in an airplane. Somehow, meeting up with Peggy Cromies, the world traveler, all right, and, uh, and running into her in an airport somewhere. The very fact that you can get on an airplane in one place and fly to another place is built on the fact that the universe is governed by laws, Amen? You, you power this much thrust and this much lift and the airplane will take off. If the universe was just random, you wouldn't be able to do that. If you couldn't predict tides, you couldn't sail. Everything about the universe is created by God with order and it reveals his great majesty and his great wonder. But the crowning moment in creation was when God made us. In fact, the entire account in Genesis is built to, to, to build towards and highlight the creation of man. It was no accident. It wasn't like God had a few spare things up in, heaven, uh, you know, up in heaven, and he was you know, playing around with a big ball of clay one day, and he was like, eh, let me see what will happen if I throw that out there and make the earth. Eh, I better light that up. I better throw a sun out there. He wasn't doing that systematically he was building a world and preparing it for his creation, man. And there's something different about man, so different 
that he has to call attention to it. So different than the animals. We are created in the image of God. And, and I've told you before, that means a lot of things. We have intellect. We can think. We can reason. We can rationalize. Uh, makes us different than the animals. I like to tell you stories about my, 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 my dog, Koi. Koi's a, a wonderful dog. He's cute as they all can be. He, you know, um, you would expect, they say that dogs resemble their owners. And uh, so he's kind of lazy and he's kind of fat. And he loves Notre Dame football, all right? But, but, but Koi, the other day, I, I noticed was biting. I don't know how I others say that he was biting his rear end. Which is kind of par for the course for this dog. He's not that bright. But I realize something's bothering him back there. He's, he's, he's chasing it around. He's, he's missing. And the only thing Koi knows to do is keep fooling. What happened was probably, we're not sure. It, it could be a hot spot, but the, they said it don't really look like a hot spot. It, it looks like maybe he got bit by something. All right? And, and he's just chasing around. And he's rubbed himself raw to the point where you could tell it was quite painful. But he's a dog. And dogs, as in some ways, they're smart, but sometimes they're just dumb. So the only thing the dog knows to do is keep biting the very thing that hurts him. And you ever go to the doctor and say, Doc, it hurts when I do this? So they tell you, don't do that. All right? That's what Koi, Koi's just biting at it, and he doesn't know something's wrong. I take him over and get him some ointment for him. He's freaked out. Now, let me show you something about Koi. As much as Koi, I believe, loves me, when I tried to touch that sore yesterday and put some ointment on it, he tried to bite me. Why? Because he's a dog. And when dogs feel hurt, they'll bite what they think is hurting them. Now, I could get all sensitive about that. I could be, you know, I could be all sensitive and go, oh, Koi don't love me. No, Koi's just being a dog. You know, and so I grabbed him by the leash and I sprayed the stuff on his butt. He looked at me kind of funny, like, that's weird. And, uh, and then kind of went, that felt pretty good. He, he walked by and stick it at me, hoping I'd spray that thing again. Why? Because he's a dog. That's what they do. It trained him. We're different than that. Proving that. In my mind, I looked and said, something's wrong with Koi, and I rationalized he's hurt something. I need to get some medicine, and I got to fix In a million years, that wouldn't occur to that dog. We're created rational, intelligent beings. And by the way, that was all free. None of that's on my notes. Because really what I want to tell you about was that we're created for relationships. As much as we want to make a relationship with you, hurt that dog, he'll bite you. Man, we're created with relationships. How do we know that? Well, God's a relational being. Think about it for a minute. In his nature, God is a relational being. Father, Son, Holy Spirit existing together eternally. They live together in a perfect triunity in a relationship with one another. God's made us to reflect that. That's why he says it's not good that man should be alone, and he builds Eve. That's why he's built us with the capacity. By the way, that's why he, when he saves us, he makes us part of the church because we're created to be relational. Now, why is that important? Well, the next scene is fall. You remember what happens, Adam and Eve sin. It starts when Satan came and tempted Eve and and. and God, Satan got Eve questioning the goodness of God and questioning her relationship with God. And that causes her to sin, and she convinces Adam. And by the way, it didn't take much convincing. Adam's a brilliant spiritual eater. She comes up, and he says, eat this. And he went, okay. He knew he wasn't supposed to eat that. God had told him don't eat that, but he ate it anyways. I don't know why. We'll have to wait till we get to heaven to ask him. But you know what immediately happens? Immediately, their relationships are broken. The first evident sign of sin is a breach in the relationship, first most evident in Adam and Eve. Yeah, how, how do I know that? They had been naked with each other the whole time. 
They didn't have a stitch of clothes on the whole time. I don't know how long they lived in the Garden of Eden. All right? But however long that had been, you could probably ask Adam, and he could give it down to the minute. And suddenly, there's a breach in their relationship, and they look at each other and go, oh, we're naked. Now, you say, what's the problem with that? Don't be perverted about this. Don't, don't, don't make this dirty. There had never been any reason for them to be afraid of that. They could be vulnerable. To be naked is to be vulnerable, right? There's nothing more vulnerable than, than just... I was in a hospital a couple years ago, and, uh, and uh, all they gave me was one of those gowns to put over you. <laughs> and it takes a lot of gown, brother, all right, to cover this, all right? I was laying there, and I'll be honest with you, man, I was, I hated it. I didn't want anybody around. And a friend of mine came by and visited me. And finally, I just looked at him, and I said, do you realize I'm laying here half naked? What is wrong with you? We're normally, that's a barrier. It was a barrier to Adam and Eve. They were embarrassed. They took and made fig leaves and tried to cover their nakedness. And then there's a second evidence of their breach in their relationship. It was between Adam and Eve and God. God had made it a habit of coming and meeting with them. Now they run. What's it show you? The relationship is broken. God begins immediately to fix that relationship that was broken by the fall. You know what he does? First thing he does, he takes a couple animals and he kills them and he makes skins, clothes to cover Adam and Eve. That was a symbol that their shame of their nakedness, but it also is picturing something even greater. That in order to deal with their sin problem, there would have to be a sacrifice. So temporarily, God provided the sacrifice for their sin by the killing of an animal. And that's going to be repeated all through the Old Testament. There's going to be this sacrificial system that would temporarily deal with the sin of the people, but it did not deal with it perfectly. And he begins to make a promise, I'm going to send someone is going to be the perfect sacrifice for your sin. And every time you see an animal slain in the Old Testament, it is pointing us forward to the coming of Jesus. Every prophecy, almost every time we see something in the Old Testament, on almost every page of the Old Testament, there are predictions and pictures and, and, and prophecies made of the coming of Jesus. Because God had a plan. And he tells us this. He didn't come up with that plan in the garden. He had that plan in mind before he ever even created Adam and Eve. That's why he calls Jesus the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the earth. See, God has been on a, on a mission. And, and ultimately, one of these days, he's going to restore this earth back to an even more glorious state than it was before the fall. You don't believe me? Read the last two chapters of the book of Revelation. Heaven is not somewhere out there. Heaven comes to earth. He transforms the earth. He transforms us and deals and, and removes that presence of sin once and for all. God has been on mission. Jesus says, listen, the Father has sent me to be an integral part of that mission. I've come to carry out what my Father had started all of those generations about. Jesus is telling them, I've come to fulfill that. But then he says something else. Did you notice that? He said, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. The mission of the church is to continue to do what Jesus had already started. Now, that, that doesn't mean that we have to give our lives to die for the sins of people. That's not what it means. But we do give our lives to preach and to share the good news of Jesus with the world. You'll see that in all of the Gospels and in the book of Acts, five different times, we are given the Great Commission. A little different form in each of the Gospels, but basically the same gist. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. Jesus says, Go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What's he say? This is your mission. Go into the world. Make disciples of all nations. Go out there and preach the gospel, not only to every individual, but every nation, every tribe, every tongue. Everybody you can find, preach the gospel to. In Acts, he 
He says, that's going to work out kind of like in concentric circles. It's going to begin there in your own local town, the city of Jerusalem for the disciples. He says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, right here, in your town. Well, how do we do that? How do we maintain our mission here in our local community? Well, um, first of all, we try to organize our church around that, that, that strategy, we try to look and say, well, look, how do we identify and see the needs out there? We've got multiple ministry groups that, that try to help with that. One thing we're trying to do very strongly, and I want you to hear me very carefully because I'm going I'm to I'm draw a very fine distinction here. We're trying to develop, move away from a member mentality to a missionary mentality. Now, we're not changing the vocabulary so much. We're not dropping the, the idea of being a member of the church. But sometimes when people become a member of something, they think of it in terms like, I've joined the country club. I'm a member of the country club. What does that mean? Well, that means I enjoy all the rights and benefits of being a member uh, of the country club. I can go over there and I can golf. I can go over there and use the swimming pool. I can go over there and use the banquet facility. I can go over there and use, uh, you know, I can fish in the ponds. I, I can use that property because I am a member. Membership in our mindset in America comes with privileges. I be joined, I join a tape club. Back in the 80s, I think I'm still getting tapes back at my address in Steubenville, all right? You join the RCA Tape Club, and for two pennies, they will send you 20 cut-rate tapes. And then they send you a tape every month, and you have to pay outrageously for it. All right? I'm a member. We have membership, and we think it's privileges. That's how we've treated the church for several generations in America. In fact, the church has even bought into that. Let's advertise and let people know what services we have that the other church down the street doesn't have because we are, we are, we are basically uh, trying to appeal to them as we would consumers, you know? So when Apple brings out a new phone, they appeal to a consumer, say this phone has this benefit over this benefit and this benefit over that benefit, and try to make you want that. That's how we've done church. Our church has a better this and has a better this or this and that. Can I say this to you? That's foreign to the Bible. You don't see that in the Scripture. In the Scriptures, members are missionaries. Members become part. It's not a question of what does the church have. I'm going to sound like John F. Kennedy here for a moment. It's not about what does the church have to offer me, but why has God placed me there to serve? What has God called me to do? Missionaries have an outward focus. They see themselves as a resource. They give, they seek to serve others. They ask, what do I have to offer in this mission? So they begin to look and say, well, listen, God has gifted me. You know, everybody in our church has a gift. Did you know that? Every single member of the church has a gift. Some of them can sing. My goodness, Jenna, and, uh, Jenna and, and, and Jacob can stand up here like a modern-day Donnie and Marie Osmond. Just as good-looking as them. Sing a little bit better, all right? They're, they got a musical ability. I, in a million years, I could never do that. In a million years, you don't want me to sing, all right? We have gifts. We have abilities. Some people have administrative abilities. We have folks in our church that amaze me with how they can take a project and organize it. Others have a teaching ability. If you've ever listened to Donnie uh, Gregory for five minutes or Shane, uh, uh, they've got an incredible teaching ability. Different in their styles, all right? But an incredible teaching ability. Others have an incredible serving gift. We've got some of our deacons uh, uh, who are just out here all the time doing all kinds of stuff, just every day, serving here, serving there. Um, uh, the other night, I ran into Sonny Summers at a Mexican restaurant, on, on Friday, and, and Sonny's got a, an engineer's kind of ability. He works in our, on our, our uh, trustees, and we've got some other guys, Jake and some of those guys. They all work in there. They understand how do you maintain, how do you keep a building. Some of those things apply to our mission, 
Because see, we don't have just a mission here, but we also have a mission to Judea and Samaria, those, those, other, those other areas around our state. Um, several years ago, we helped plant a church in, this, in DeKalb, Illinois, the Church of DeKalb, and got, helped it get up and running. And, and I know their pastor has told us on several occasions we would not be here had it not been for First Baptist just through the encouragement, through the financial giving, through the, the teams that we sent up there. Now we're starting into looking at the greater Chicago area. And, 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 you know, we went up there this summer and we said, well, where could we help plant churches? You know, see, here's the thing is, we can sit around all day and we can complain about Chicago. Oh, the crime's bad in Chicago. Yeah, duh. A lot of lost people in Chicago. Where there's a lot of lost people, tend to be a lot of crime. Duh. And if the answer is stay out of it or make fun of it, then you've missed the point that Jesus says. When when you see great lostness, it is a wide open door where Jesus is saying, look at the lostness of this town. Come and help. And so what's happening, there's church planting happening all over the city of Chicago. We're going to get involved in, in three of those efforts down around the South Loop area up in the Evanston area and in a little town called Pingree Grove. Our teenagers were up there this summer and some of the adults and working on developing those relationships. Over the coming years, churches are going to be planted in those communities and those churches are going to plant other churches so that we can see that great city of millions and millions of people. I was standing there on the balcony with Dennis Connor one day looking at South Loop. South Loop is an area right inside the Loop of Chicago. Uh, it's a big housing upscale housing development. I mean, it's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy an apartment in any of these areas. There's like 50,000 people that live in this. You can see that. I was standing there on the balcony and looking out at a town, that, at an area that was half the size of the city of Metropolis geographically and 10 times the population nearly. And he says, I can hardly find anybody in that community that's a Christian. So they're planting a church there. You see, we're on a mission. And what do we do? We send people up there. We've got a, a, a mission to the other uh, ends of the world. You know, he says there in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, our other ends of the world have, 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 have largely been in Haiti. I heard a rumor the other day. Someone said that we're going to cut back our missions program to Haiti. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, I'm going to say that I know Darren's getting ready to head down there just very shortly. Uh, they got a brand new agriculture, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, ministry opportunity uh, that can change the economics of that community. You say, why are you changing the economics? Because if we can keep them from being worried about starving to death, maybe we can help them to hear the gospel a little more effectively. And not only that, from that, that can be a tool to spread the gospel all over the country of Haiti. That's happening. Every year, dozens and dozens and dozens of people go out and do that. We're we're working on trying to develop a a partnership in in Italy to help reach an unreached people group. That sounds kind of odd to say an unreached people group in Italy, doesn't it? I mean, come on, Italy. You think everybody's a Christian in Italy. Not true. Very, very small percentage of the population is Italian. Here's what happened. The, the Reformation that happened in Europe basically skipped Italy. And so what happened was the decline of the church, instead of re, re-blossoming like it did in Germany and Switzerland and other places during the Reformation, it just continued that downgrade in Italy to the point now where hardly anybody there actually attends church. Most of them are not Christian. So what's happening? We're working with Marco and Fede sailing and helping to try to find ways to plant a church there in the city of Bologna. All of that's happening through this little church in southern Illinois. Isn't that amazing? See, all I love about that, that's not about us, guys. We could sit there and we could brag about that. We could get all, you know, big chest and go, look how, look at all we do. No, 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 you don't get it. It's not us doing it. It is God doing it through us. He gets all the glory because he reminds us here in this very passage 
that alone, there's no way we could ever do this. That's why he says, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. That's why in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea. Did you notice that? He didn't tell them, you'll be my witnesses until he first told them, I'm going to empower you to do this job. Here's the, here's the stark reality of it. Everything we're doing of value in the kingdom of God must be bigger than us. Hey, here's the bottom line. If we can do it in our strength, it's not God. It's not God. God calls us to do things that are outrageous, that are incredible. We sit there and go, well, you know, God, I remember the first few trips that, that, that our church started going on mission trip-wise. We looked at it and wondered, how in the world are we? I have a friend of mine that's getting ready to send a couple of his folks on one of our Haiti trips. He's the youth pastor at the church I used to pastor back in West Virginia. And they've gotten convicted that God wants them to go on a mission trip. And he said to me one day, I'll just be glad if we can get there and get back. That's his goal. That's, his, that's Larry Garrison's goal for missions. I'd like to just get there and get back, not lose him. We were there a few years ago. Amen? Wonder how do we go through this? It looked daunting. How are we going to plant a church in DeKalb? We were confronted with one of the most pagan cities I think I've ever heard of. How are we ever going to make an impact there? They're not, the culture's not like us. It's people from all over the world. It's people who think differently. They're not Southern Illinoisans. How are we going to do it? And guess what? Here's what we figured out. Really, we don't have to know. Somehow, God just empowers us to do it over and over and over again. We go out. We watch these guys this summer go out in, in Chicago. And, and, you know, here I am, their pastor, oh, ye of little faith. I'm wondering, oh, man, we're sending these kids to Pingree Grove. What's going to happen to them? They're telling us right up front, nothing has been done in this area. This is, this is untouched area. Um, it, it, to be very honest with you, spiritually, it would have been the equivalent of just sending them and dropping them off in the deepest, darkest jungle of Africa, the deepest jungle of South America, the deepest jungle of Asia. It was that equivalent spiritually, what we thought we were dropping it into. They started walking up the and I'll just use there, I'll just you know, old Duckworth over here, Ducky. He's a good-looking guy. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but God was working through him, giving him words to say, words to speak over and over again. We watch that. You say, can anybody do that? Yes. See, that's what's exciting. That's what is passionate. You ask me, what's the greatest thing about First Baptist Church? What's the thing that I'm most excited about at First Baptist Church? It's that we're on a mission. Can I be honest with you? I'm really not concerned about whether we build a mega church right here. People ask me every once in a while, hey, you know, such and such church, you know, grow by this much. Or, uh, you know, that's wonderful. And I would love to see our church grow and become very large. But I'll be very honest with you. As long as we're on mission, doing what God's called us to do. See, obedience is, but we could cut corners and, and gather people. But we want to do it right. And we want to be on a mission that's bigger. Isn't that awesome? We're doing something bigger than ourselves. I, I sit back and think about sometimes. I was watching the program the other day about Vietnam, the Vietnam War. Anybody been watching that? Ken Burns? Anything Ken Burns does, I'm in. Even if I, he could make a documentary about frogs and I would watch it. The best documentary maker ever. All right, I love watching him. He did the Civil War. He did the one on World War II. He's done this one. And I was thinking the other day, I knew a lot of Vietnam vets over the years. And I know a lot of the struggles they've had and I've often wondered, I realized something, the difference between sometimes the World War II vet and the Vietnam vet. The guy in World War II, I'm not saying they all had this, but mostly, 
had a vision and a mission. They had a clear, I'm not saying that it wasn't, you know, as Sherman would have said, war is hell. It was difficult. It was ugly. It was brutal. But it had a mission. The difference was sometimes in Vietnam, it wasn't clear exactly what are we fighting for. What are we doing here? Why are we doing? See, it's not enough just to be doing things. We have to know why we're doing it, and that's the mission. And the mission isn't up for us to sit down and see if we can mimic Coca-Cola or Ikea. Our mission is to take what Jesus has already told us. This is what I'm inviting you to. Isn't that cool? Let me think about it. When Jesus showed up and talked to Peter, he said, Peter, follow me. He gave Peter a mission follow me. Just come and do what I'm doing. He's done the exact same thing with you. Amen? Come, follow me. We're going to go on mission. You said, where's that going to go? I have no idea. It brought me all the way from Ohio to Illinois. If you'd have told me I was coming here, I'd never even heard of Metropolis other than the Superman movies. He'll take you wherever he wants you. But I'm going to tell you something. It'll be one of the most incredible adventures of your life. You want something that's bigger than yourself. Get on mission with God through the local church. Amen. Let's stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you for this day and your blessings. Lord, we thank you that you've invited us to be on mission with you. Lord, you've made us part of something that's so much bigger than what we could ever imagine. Lord, it's an eternal plan. Started clear back before you even created the universe. And Lord, continues each day as we continue to serve you and do the work that you've called us. Lord, help us to see our lives, not as members who receive privileges, but as missionaries who invest their lives. Lord, I pray that you guide us and lead us through this time of invitation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.